Hey everyone, welcome back to another Tic Tac Tyco. I've got a lot of videos about soloing on my channel, but up until now, every single one of them has been about improvisation. But this week, we're going to look at the other side of things. We are going to look at solo crafting. Whether you call it scripting, crafting, setting, prescribing, it's all the same thing. It's writing a solo in advance for a particular song that you're going to play the same way every single time you solo in that song. Now while I clearly lean heavily towards the improvisation side of things, I have definitely scripted my share of solos. There's two really good things about scripting a solo. First, you practice the same skills in that solo over and over and over and you get better at them. You also develop a sense of confidence because you're familiar with what you're playing. Now there is a bit of a diminishing return over time, but I'm not going to get into that this time. The other strength of a scripted solo is that it's customizable. Just because you've written it to be a certain way doesn't mean you can't ever change it. Let's say you know you're going to be the first soloist of all the solos, then you want to maybe play something a little different in the beginning to make it stand out, to draw attention in. Or maybe you know that all of the solos have to be shorter because you have less time in the song, so you take out a couple of bars in the middle. This week, I'm going to take you through the steps of how I craft a solo. Step by step, we'll walk through it. I'll actually do it as I talk about it, and we'll see what we come up with. The first thing I do is consider the song. I do this before I even touch a drum or any piece of equipment. Considering the song for me involves four different steps. Step number one, I wanna know what I'm playing on. Is it one drum? Is it multiple drums? Are there different tones over the drums, like a shime and a chudaiko? Am I playing naname, odaiko, okero? Whatever I'm playing limits and shapes what I can play. The next thing I look at is what kind of G I'm going to be playing on. And as far as I'm concerned, there's three different categories. If it's dongo, a swung triplet, there's patterns that don't work with it and there's patterns that work well with it. And then inversely so if it's not a dongo, if it's a straight beat or donsuku or dorotsuku, anything that's very even and flat. If it's a proprietary G, that is, it's a, a pattern written specifically for the song, then that will also inform what kind of patterns I will and probably will not play. The third layer is really simple, tempo. Some things feel better when played fast, some things are better suited for slow tempo. And finally, what was the purpose of the composer in writing this piece? Can I ask them? Can I talk to people who knew what the composer wanted? Are there liner notes? This will let me know, is it a fun piece? Is it a festive piece? Is it a serious piece? Is it an intense piece? I might know from playing it, but I really want to know what the purpose was behind the song. This will definitely start to shape and, and give rough edges to what I'm about to do next. Next, we look at a beginning, a middle, and an end. All good solos have those three components. A good beginning is like saying to the audience, hey, Look at me, look at me over here. I've got something you're gonna to wanna to watch. It's sort of a promise that there's more to come. The middle can be a lot of different things. I like to think of it as an anchor point, not a literal point, but something to grab onto, to hold onto. So I start with the opening and then I'm playing whatever and boom, okay, I can lock into where I'm supposed to be. I know where the downbeat is, I know where the song is, I'm good to go on to the next. It's also another sort of promise to the audience like, hey, remember the beginning, how strong that was? Look, I've got something in the middle that reminds you to keep watching all the way to the end. A strong ending can salvage mistakes that you made in the solo up until that point, but a lukewarm ending, it can really bring a strong solo down. So having a nice strong ending is a really good way to end. It makes you feel good, makes the audience feel good. Oh, and it's worth mentioning, you can write this in any order you want. You can start with the middle if you know you have something really cool you want to kind of just throw in there and figure the rest out later. You can start with the end and then work your way backwards. This is your solo. You write it how you want. So let's start crafting a solo using those two points. First, considering the song. I can make up anything I want. I've got anonymous set setup, so hey, it's anonymous. Let's have it um, a generic, festive, not too serious song. Uh, tempo is average, the G is kind of straight, not swung, not, not unusual, uh, just to make things easier. Let's do a relatively short solo, um, eight bars of four, like one, two, three, four, 
two, two, three, four, eight of those. It won't be very long, but I don't want to make this video, you know, 90 minutes long. Um, yeah, so that's, that's considering the song. Let's also say I'm the first soloist of all of the solos and I want to tell the audience, hey, hey, look at me, look over here, I'm about to play something. A really easy way to do that is to play a bunch of 16th notes, just loud and strong. Yeah, that's going to get the audience's attention, especially if I'm adding facial expressions and body language and making it look like I'm just really putting everything I got into the opening. But we can add that later. For now, musically, that's fine. And that's two bars of eight. I know what I want to end with. It's one of my favorite types of patterns. It's three over four. You get the da-dun, 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 da-dun type of pattern. I put it in a lot of my solos. So let's put that at the end. Um, it, it can just be capped off at the very end with a dong dong. That's an easy ending bar and it ends on the one. Cool. But I also want to feed into that. Um, the eighth bar right now kind of goes three, 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 two, two, one. So I can do something with fours in the beginning to kind of feed into it. Like one, two, three, four, 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 I don't want to just play downbeats. Um, I can do I can do doro. I can just kind of double the hits. So bar seven and eight might sound like this. That works. When it comes to the middle, I want to start to think of what I'm not doing yet. Right now I've got a lot of notes in the beginning and I've got the simple to a cool pattern at the end, but right now there's no movement, so let's do that. Generally, there's two types of movements. You have your angled linear movements and you have your circles, rounded movements. Let's do one of each, just because that's what I'm trying to do in the solo. Um, if I have anatomy, I like to do sort of a, a point across and then a cross and a swing. So I've got this angle and I've got this angle. If the audience is here, I can look sideways and then look in front. But if the audience is there, I can look in front and look sideways, whatever. I like this motion. Um, I also, again, tendencies start to pop up right away, but I like to do a type of pattern. Don, don, stan, don, don, stan. So let's do that. That's one bar right there. So that's my angle pattern. The circular pattern, I mean, you can do a lot of things with the circles. Um, okay, maybe, um, I like that, maybe, okay, I can do something like this. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to play, I can't play the upbeat, uh, I can't play on the downbeats, I'm gonna have to play starting with an upbeat, and then I can just do upbeats. That's really simple. Um, yeah, okay. I'm going to end thong, thong, because, well, tell you what, let me just show you those two patterns back to back and you can hear how there's a similarity between the two. There's that thong, thong in the linear and thong, thong in the circular. So that connects them even though they look very different. I like it. All right, now I've got this, this chunk of two, where do I put it? Um, I don't know. So let's try adding it to the beginning and see what that sounds and feels like. Okay, doesn't strike me either good or bad, it seems okay. Um, let's try shifting it over and adding it to the ending and see what that sounds like. Hmm. Okay. I'm slightly leaning towards uh, adding it to the end. 
and I'll tell you why. Having this pattern end up here and then going right into the doro, doro, it feels nice. My hands are there, which is where they are for most of this pattern as well. It, it's a very subjective thing, but it kind of feels like it goes together just slightly more than this pattern did with the beginning. So there you go. I've got patterns one, two, five, six, seven, eight. Now I just need to fill in three and four. It would be nice to somehow come off of the first two patterns, which is all blah, 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 into something that says there's a little bit of movement before going into the big motions. So um, if I've got da 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 if I do it at halftime, dun 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 dun. Um, and then if hey, if I <laughs> if I just do this with one hand, the other hand is free to move, and I want some kind of movement. So um, cool. Huh. There's that, there's that syncopation again. I, I tend to like that don't stomp pattern. And so if I do that, that's going to link it somewhat to the patterns that have the don't don't stomp, stomp, stomp. So it's almost a theme. Maybe no one else will notice it but me, but I like it because it helps kind of feel cohesive to me. Now we just need one more pattern. I've got dun 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 dun. Uh, yeah, I can just I can just do a bunch of threes after that. It's already dun 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 kind of skipping feel. So. And then that would go into the dun dun dun. Cool. All together, this is what the solo sounds like. Nice. Now I can move on to the next steps, which aren't as involved because I just established a skeletal framework I can build on top of. At this point, I start to add dynamics, loud, soft, accents, crescendos, decrescendos, giving it a little bit of flavor. A lot of taiko solos tend to be all loud, 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 and I, I can't fault taiko players. It's fun to make loud, big notes, but this is my solo and I wanna write something that I think sounds cool. The first two bars, I like the way they are. They start strong and they end strong. I don't want to change it. I don't want to crescendo up. It's I'm going to keep it the way it is for now. Bar three, I mean, I could crescendo something, but I feel like it's a lot of work with one hand. Um, I do remember when I was practicing this, I wanted to play this note louder because it's coming from a really high position. So now I can, now I've got an accent really nice and strong. And then da 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 da. Nah, I, I'm okay keeping that where it is. And then da da sta da da sta da da sta. I could, yeah, not feeling it. Seems okay. Um, sta 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 sta. Might be fun to crescendo that. Sta uh, sta. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to crescendo when this is already really big and make this a, a little, uh, a quiet note and louder. So what I'm gonna do is make it a visual and audible crescendo. So it's gonna start visually small, this sort of a feel. I like that, it, it, it makes it easier to do and it grows, it's something for the audience to feel and see happening. Um, da 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 I can stay. Da 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 da. Yeah, I'm not going to change that. That's a really fun ending. I'm not going to change. Um, so let's see what it sounds like. Put it all together. tell you why hmm there's something that doesn't quite feel right to me on crescendoing in bar six 
and then bar seven and bar eight are just loud. It feels like I'm peaking too early. So what if I crescendo one bar later on the seven, which is the da 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 I like it, but I feel like I still want to do something with the circle. So why not decrescendo on bar six and crescendo on bar seven? So it'll be something, uh, again, visually as well, something big, not so big, smaller, and then I'm crescendoing on bar seven and then da 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 da. I like it. Um, so let's just play the, the last half because that's the only change I'm making. The next thing I like to do is bridge the gap. If you listen to a lot of taiko solos, you can almost count bars of four, four, four. They're, they're sort of self-contained phrases. Nothing wrong with it, but it becomes a little predictable. And sometimes it's nice to do a four, and then it'd be a two, and then an eight, and then a four. It, the audience could still enjoy your solo, but they can't predict where the ending is going to be each time. It's a little more interesting musically. Right now, my solo sounds a lot like chunk of two, chunk of two, chunk of two, chunk of two. And there's no surprise, that's kind of how it was written. So by bridging the gaps, we can maybe change that landscape a little bit. We've got the opening. I'm not going to change that. Um, that. That end needs to be there. Kind of gives it a space for the audience to breathe. So next is a dun 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 um I feel like I can connect that. If I play one more note on the three, it will I think bind the fourth and fifth bar together. Uh what is it? Dun dun Yeah, I can just, that would come next if I was just playing non-stop threes and I'm just stopping to play uh, the fifth bar. So it's, uh, and it's an easy motion to do. I'm hitting it on the, mo on the, the point out. So, dance, 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 dance. It kind of sounds like bar five starts a little early, which is what I like, a little bit of a bleed so that it doesn't sound like all twos. I'll keep it. And then we've got the big circles into the small circles and da 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 I'm okay keeping this simple. So there's not a lot of bridge building in this solo, but it's a short solo. There aren't as many opportunities. Still, I looked it over. I found a place I could add one note, make a small bridge, and that works. The next element I add is a lot of fun. This is nuance and spectacle. A spectacle is designed to draw the audience's attention in, to take their breath away, if you will. And it can be a lot of things. It can be something acrobatic. It can be a bocce twirl. It can be a long or loud key eye. Uh, it can be a complicated time signature within a solo or even fancy syncopation. But, and this is really important, think of a spectacle as a very strong spice. A little bit goes a long way. Too much is overpowering. I have seen a few solos that were mostly spectacle, and as an audience member, it's exhausting. It has the opposite effect. It doesn't draw me in. In fact, it, it makes me want to distance myself because it's too much and I, I need a break. So be careful with spectacle, but it's fun. It's fun to put in, absolutely. Nuance, on the other hand, is something the audience may never see. You're mostly doing it for yourself, and it can be something very subtle like Maybe slowly changing hand positions over time. Maybe uh, a hand position in contrast to something earlier or later in the song. Could also be where on the drum you're striking. Center, off center, near the edge, or the, the kind of strike you're doing. Maybe not a bounce off, maybe a, a buzz roll. And you won't hear a buzz roll very well on the pad, but on a taiko, absolutely. I don't really think there's too much danger in doing too much nuance. But you have to start thinking, how much am I really just sort of uh, entertaining myself versus giving something the audience might enjoy? For sake of this drill, I'm going to add one element of nuance and one element of spectacle. 
I'm going to admit, as I was creating this whole solo, I, I had an idea where I would want to put nuance, and I'm going to put it in the seventh bar, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. instead of just regular hits, I'm going to press hit, which is rather than bouncing, I'm pressing. It's not getting a bounce. It's a muffled sound. It's kind of fun. I can do it. It's really easy. That's it. As for spectacle, it's easy, at least I find it easy to jump, to make big arm motions. Um, so the only thing I need is space to do it. If I'm jumping around or away from the drum, I can't hit at the same time. I mean, I can, but it's kind of sloppy. But right now, my solo is chock full of stuff. There's one place that I can take a, a, at least a couple of notes away from, and that's the opening. I haven't wanted to change it, but it doesn't mean I can't shorten it, right? Right now, the second bar plays all the way up through that fourth note. One, two, three, four. And then I get a bit of a breath before I go right into the third bar. So instead of playing all the way to the fourth note, if I play to the third note, I'll have a little bit of extra wiggle room or breathing room. One, two, three. And uh, it's not much, but it's enough to do something. And that's where my spectacle will be. Now, for purposes of safety of this room and myself, I can't do a big spectacle like I might normally do. But something I like to sometimes even begin a solo with is uh, a big double arm circle, jump away and come back in. So I'm going to do a version of that. It, it will kind of go like this. One, two, three, four. Two, two, three. Boom! And then I come back in on bar three. And you know what I'm realizing? If I'm coming from here into bar three, this note's going to want to be strong and loud. So it's going to want to go bam, 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 bam. Why not? There's dynamics that I'm adding, even though I passed the dynamic, the dynamic phase. Doesn't mean I can't put in dynamics later. So now we've got our entire solo. Let's see if I can play it all the way through. Groovy. And that leaves us with one last crafting element, and that's key or energy. This can manifest in a lot of different ways. Your facial expressions, your body language, your ki eye if you want. I like to save this part for the end. I feel like it's the sprinkles on the cupcake because it's the performance part. And now that I've got a substantial solo to work with, I can start to sort of fill in whatever cracks and gaps are left with something entertaining through key. I'm not going to spend a lot of time like I did with the other sections going, I wonder what would fit in bar. No, I'm just going to put down what I think would look good based on my experience and what I know I would do normally. For bars one and two, I might simply squint a little bit, a little bit of physical exertion in the face, making it seem like it's more difficult than it is. And maybe my head goes back and forth. Ah, that kind of a feeling. That's pretty simple. Um, Dun, 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 dun. Just gonna let my body kind of move with it. Not much else from that. Dun, dun, dun. Looking at the camera, looking away, looking at the camera. And then as I get smaller, I think I'm gonna kind of crunch my body, um, lose the posture a little bit on purpose to bring the attention in and the energy down. And then as I come back, I'll reset, I'll reinflate. And then da 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 That's going to be similar to the beginning where it's just, I've got nothing left. It's all here. I'm leaving it all out on stage. Again, a little bit of performance. And this is what the solo looks like in full. I told you that key was the last crafting step, but there's one final crafting step that's probably more important than everything else so far. 
practice the out of your solo. I cannot overstate how important this is. I know I make it sound silly, but it's probably the most important part of solo crafting, even if it's the least amount of fun. I have seen far, far too many soloists playing a relatively new or brand new solo and it falls apart. And who knows why, it could be any number of things. The pressure of performing, the tempo was faster, the tempo was slower, uh, you made accidental eye contact with an audience member, anything can throw you off if you're not super, super comfortable. And look, we don't all have hours and hours a day to practice as many times as we want to, but when you think you have it, assume you don't and practice some more. Make yourself really, really strong with that solo because there's almost nothing worse for a soloist than to put a ton of time into a brand new solo and then it falls apart. It's happened to me, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking as an audience member too. So do yourself a favor. Once you get to this level, practice. And there you go. This is how I generally craft a solo. I don't always do things in the same order. Sometimes I, I take out a step or add a step. It really depends on the song, my mood, what's going on at the time. My way may not work for you and that's fine, but I'm hoping that what you just saw gives you ideas for if and when you craft the solo, maybe some inspiration, and maybe you even learn what you don't wanna do when you're crafting your own. Feel free to leave comments if you do something similar to what I do or different, or you have questions or ideas, anything on this subject, let other people see the comments and let them know what the options and possibilities are for crafting. If you like this video, let me know with a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and until next time, keep on crafting and be well. Thank you.